Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I am here with Egg Chug and Michael Kester. Yeah, Chug and Eggs, taking names. I was going to go with Secret Ninja, Michael Kester. Both of those are uh, entirely appropriate. Um, We're doing a show today. We're doing one in, I I guess, sort of a grand experiment. It is. Some shows. Uh, Tell me about the films and tell me what the fuck is going on. Well, we're doing, uh, today we're going to do Rocky and Shogun Assassin. So we're officially second episode into the year. Yeah. Third, if you count. We're already already beginning our uh, potential train wreck. Right. We'll just start early, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So, um, what? The idea here is basically uh, we're going on. So the idea is to go on two separate journeys at the same time. Love it. Um, Good. Basically, we're going through uh, all the Rocky films, mm-hmm. which is, that's my journey. Okay. So, so anybody who who is listening to the show can pick which of the two double feature co hosts are uh, right. are more closely affiliated with them. So, my journey is the six Rocky films, sure, which I've never seen, which I'm being led on by uh, my friend uh, Eric Ingram here. That would be me. And uh, the other the other half of this journey is through the uh, exploitation of Asian samurai cinema, which you may think is not a journey and is instead just <laughs> kind of a silly thing that couldn't possibly have a background. Right. But that my job is to debunk that theory. And okay, if, interesting. If, if you're confused by samurai cinema, then I believe you're in Eric Ingram's camp. Not only are you presenting me a journey. You're presenting me a thesis yes. as well. Yeah, this is far more homework than you usually prepare for our show. Mm-hmm. I'm proud. So the, we have a, a bit of a misguided east-west kind of. Yeah, weird, we have no fucking ideas. Basically, that would be the uh, the the spark notes to what I just said is uh. <laughs> well, you know what I thought as we were trying to figure all this out is that uh, Terminator and the Prophecy went so well. Yeah, that was amazing. If we could just go ahead and string that out over an entire year. Mm-hmm. What I was really thinking is that I love the Rocky films. Uh Uh-huh. And there's just close to not enough Rocky to fill six shows. Uh Uh-huh. But more Rocky than one show. Okay. We debated today Rocky Killapalooza for a while, but that just seems like a terrible idea. Yeah, you can't, because from what I've seen... You don't uh, even need to explain why. I think it's evident. Turtle soup. And this seemed to fit because... You know, we go on these personal sort of projects we have, mm-hmm. not projects in the in the sense we're making things, but uh, film watching projects, right. I guess, where we will try and find out, we'll try and learn something about a certain director or a certain camp of people or a certain kind of film. And over time, we will watch a bunch of these. Yeah. Sometimes we watch them all in a row, mm-hmm. but what's more likely is every couple of weeks we'll watch a new one. Yeah. Like you did with the uh, the Leone stuff. Right. And the yeah. Westerns, right? Uh, like you did with Kaiju. Yes. So you do quite a few of these. Yeah, I do. Jaunts. I call them jaunts. So this is kind of, we want to bring listeners along on a jaunt. Yes. We want to kind of check in once in a while and just do a couple of these. And this is going to kind of uh, culminate around Kill Bill. Yeah. On the Asian side of things. Yes. The Rocky side is very direct. The Rocky side will culminate on Rocky Balboa. <laughs> right. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's a, for me, I really wanted to get into all this Asia stuff and I don't understand it. it right. It frightens and baffles me as anybody who's ever listened to our coverage of, I, I almost want to say anything foreign, but it's yeah. specifically Asian cinema. Yeah. Doesn't matter what part of Asia. Sukiyaki Western Django. Right. As long as it's coming from somewhere in Asia, I'm confused and a little terrified. (laughs) But I understand or at least love Kill Bill. We got to get Kill Bill on the show somewhere. So we're going to make it even more confusing. And we're going to center our Asian journey around the American Kill Bill films. Right. Well, basically, what's going to happen is we're going to show how it started in Asia, what. America did to it, and then how Asia responded. Beautiful, beautiful. So we're going to end up in that new Asia extreme, weird machine something kind of territory. Something with machines. This idea makes even less sense than when we started the show, Uh but sounds like an even better idea, which is pretty much, I think, the most we can hope for. So we're not going to do these all in a row, because that would just alienate people who weren't into this journey, and Uh I totally get that. We'll do them every couple months or something. Sure. 
we figured it out so that the pace seems okay and you won't be annoyed by it. So I'm going to start pretty grounded. I'd like to start uh, with Rocky, where things are uh, simple but effective, which is what I'm good at. Great. And we're going to spoil this Rocky film. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after, we're going to spoil both uh, Shogun Assassin. Right. And and the first two Lone Wolf and Cub films. Okay. That sounds about right. So if you want, you can use the chapters to uh, skip over Rocky or skip over Shogun Assassin. Maybe you want to wait the entire year and just do one of these journeys and Uh then come back and do the two journeys at once might be one too many journeys. Starting with Rocky. Now, I know I tried to shoehorn some of my Rocky love in during uh, Rambo 4. Yeah. And we talked about a a couple of these things, but they're definitely worth going back over. Uh, First is that Rocky is written by Sylvester Stallone. Right. And eventually directed, right? We'll talk about that stuff when we get into it. There's a couple. No, it's all right. There's just, there's a few things I I really want to launch into already, and we're not there. Yeah, we we should save it for when it comes up. Yeah, right. So we'll see how the Stallone stuff kind of develops into the different movies and sort of the path it takes. I will tease you with this in sort of the slasher sense of things. One of these movies features a robot. So this is going to be, when I say journey, you're giving me quite a frightened stare right now. Is it a leprechaun robot? When I said journey, man, I was not kidding about journey. We start this movie out with a bunch of bums gathering around a barrel fire and singing a cappella harmonies, uh-huh. which struck me as something that was uh, missing from the Rambo know, films. I was going to say uh, comically, you know, theatrically comic, sure. I guess, something you never see in the real world. But I guess the only thing that separates that from Uptown, let's say, uh-huh. is that there's no harmonies in Uptown. That's true. There's still barrel fires. And you will still get drunk bums singing. Yeah. It just doesn't feel the same. Yeah, there's man. no rock cappella. That's exactly what it is. We're one harmony short of the truth. But this is definitely part of the environment that this down and out or little known, you know, boxing champion, sure. where the story takes place, where he comes from. Uh-huh. It's just as much the barrel fires as something like, you know, these rainy Philadelphia streets uh-huh. all the time. And we have this uh, small cast of characters. And I guess if we're ever going to hit on the characters, it's going to be the first film, because these are pretty stable throughout the series. Okay. Uh, The first one is Burt Young, who's Polly, which surprisingly we've seen on the show before. Uh, uh, I I recognized him from, um, uh, I don't remember the, it was from one of the Killapaloozas, but it was the one where the brother and the sister had intercourse. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, That was, that doesn't really narrow it down necessarily. Uh, Amityville Horror. Oh, right. Amityville 2. I thought you were going to pick on the lamp again. We just no. can't let that <laughs> yeah. shit go. The Amityville lamp. It's about time we got back to that. Oh, God, I hate you. I wonder how many people just skip over that boring shit and have no idea what we're ever talking about. That's what they get. We like to think if we include references to previous shows, it'll help people relate to concepts. Mm-hmm. Instead, it'll, it'll, they just it, think the lamp. What is that? I just feel like we need to inject the kinds of jokes that everybody is mad at us for making them endure. So Amityville 2, otherwise known as the interesting one, from the Amityville Horror uh, series. I think Polly, and uh, this is so strange to think about who these characters are, and I might be overthinking it, but they're all generally positive characters. Yeah. With the exception of Polly. Right. Who is treated as if he's one of the generally positive protagonists right. of the film. But he's a total bastard. I kind of feel like he's the only real villain in this he, movie. He's just a terrible guy. He does see... I mean, even Rocky, the, the fucking loan shark, gives Rocky $500. Yep. <laughs> the loan shark is not even the villain. Right. It's Polly. What an asshole. So I'm not alone on this, right? You think oh, yeah, Polly's no, kind I'm of... totally with you. Also, I want to mention that the loan shark is in this film called Star Crash. Uh, that oh, right, we right, right. totally get on this show. It's a different side to the loan shark. I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna get create an abbreviated list here, reasons Polly is an asshole. What what goes at the top of that list? What is the the most egregious crime here? I'm gonna go with the uh, baseball bat eviction. That's yeah. that's uh, that's <laughs> right. the top of the list for me. He he becomes horrifying at yes. that point. He goes from kind of a dick, yeah, which is you know, hey, normal Polly, kind of a dick, one of the guys. You know, you could sure. see that, sure. But he gets that baseball bat out. And now I'm thinking, is the, is this movie going to take a weird turn where we have Polly committed? Well, so I was I was afraid that Polly was going to hit Rocky, and it was going to be like one of those things where it's over because Polly ruined his arm or right, something. Right. I'm just sitting there going, "Don't hurt the prize fighter." Right. 
Exactly. Yeah, or Adrian. I mean, really, either of yeah, those well, two. Yeah, well, but at That's this point, I'm more, in, I'm more into the prize. Adrian could die, and then I would feel like the prize fighter would just fight harder. Yeah, you're just looking at the story arc. Yeah. There, certainly. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm thinking, um, at what point does this movie make a, a... No matter how we're getting out of this situation, there's going to be a weird turn here that's yeah. going to upset our... Uh, take our, our balance off of what the prize fighter needs to be doing. Adrian is, I want to say the actor's name is Telia Shire, but okay. I'm, I'm not known for my awesome pronunciation. Bonjour. Now, surprisingly, we've seen her on the show as well uh, in the Prophecy. Okay. It wasn't one of the, the major characters, but also in the Godfather stuff. And Adrian's character is one that definitely serves... I mean, when you look at the overall plot of the film, if you're going to boil this down to as simple Americana as possible, uh-huh. this is a story about these two characters. That's what the movie tells you at the end. It's sure. a love story. That's, right. <laughs> the movie is saying, hold on, were you concerned about the boxing match? Because no one else, you are the only person who cares about the outcome of this match. And maybe Apollo Creed. Right. But secretly, I'm sure he's uh, wanting to go over and ask about their romantic relationship at the end. So Adrian's an important component to that. And I think seeing the development of her and the, the growth of that character is something that wakes you up to the development of all of these characters throughout this movie and throughout the other films that we're going to see. She's someone who starts as being, I mean, extremely shy. She works in this, this pet store, mm-hmm. and it almost seems as if she's mute. Yeah. That or she hates Rocky. Also right. a possibility, right? Possible, yeah, both Rocky is this annoying Italian dude who shows up and... and tells a joke. A joke, so yeah, a joke a day or two jokes a day. Two jokes a day. I mean, you got to love him for that. Sure. Poor fucking Rocky. I mean, he's trying his heart out. That's all he's got. He's trying so hard. He wakes up every day and he comes up with a stupid joke. And every time, not a chuckle, not a glance, doesn't give a shit. So eventually we know she's in a Rocky. Right. And it just seems like this is her demeanor. She's mm-hmm. just somebody who's shy and possibly walked on given that Polly is a huge dick. So it's when this confrontation really starts coming up here that she stands up to Polly. And that's part of the growth of that character. And just an important moment, maybe not uh, when just watching this film. Right. But I'm sure it's something we'll come back to as we kind of check back in with some of these characters. And, you know, by the end of the series, sort of wonder how they've... Che- because when, you, when you're dealing with a series that's this long... We're talking about uh, uh, decades worth of sure. material. You're almost growing with these characters. Right. I mean, by the time, even though I had not seen a Rocky film uh-huh. until last year, maybe year before, right. I still, you're coming back every couple of years to the same cast. Yeah. And by the time you get to the end, they are unrecognizable from, you know, the, the characters in the beginning. Mick is another one that's going to come up quite a bit. And Mick, when you look at this first film, I think, is one of the things that is uh, most remembered. Yeah, right? well, the voice. It's certainly, certainly the voice. This sort of gravelly, excitable. I mean, he's an old man, and he just has fire in his pants yep. at all times. I believe it's eat lightning and crap thunder. They're absurd. The things that come out of his mouth are absurd. Just his entire demeanor. He seems to be the most ridiculous person. I was going to say in the movie, but maybe in the well, entire franchise. I don't know about franchise. ridiculous. I would just say passionate. Okay. Let's take passionate instead um, of ridiculous. I think, I think we have to reserve all the ridiculousness of uh, this for double Assassin. feature for Shogun Assassin. I, I will completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. So the, the other main character here, obviously then, is Rocky Balboa, who is, of course, the Italian stallion. Uh-huh. Now, I know I've told you this. It's I don't remember name. if it's, if it's on air or off air. Mm-hmm. Um, the name Italian stallion? Yeah. Sylvester Stallone's porn name. Oh, yeah, from, from when he was banging chicks for a living. Weird. Kind of mm-hmm. strange. They also make a point of asking him where the name Italian yeah, Stallion Yeah, it seems like they're from. just making fun of it. Yeah, don't they? Yeah, and he wrote it. I mean, it has to be some kind. It's either, uh, and this is one of those things I wonder about when we get these great stories for Double Feature, these unbelievable things. Being a skeptically minded person, one of two things is happening here. This is an elaborate joke that he's set up through this movie where he had a porn star name before and then he used it in the film and he made this whole big joke about it. Or it's an even more elaborate joke where everybody I've ever talked to about Rocky is in on this and they all just concede that, oh yeah, it's totally his porn name. And now I'm going on the air 
play makes sense. I've never actually seen Sylvester Stallone in pornography. I haven't either. I've heard that a lot of movie stars are in pornography. Val Kilmer, for example. Um, Interesting. But I'm uh, I'm hesitant to say that any film stars have been in porn until I see them penetrate or be penetrated. So maybe I'm not really coming on the show with all the facts straight here. Huh. An amazing story, true or false. Now, Rocky's the part that, I mean, when I talked uh, a little bit on the fourth Rambo movie, which you gave a wonderful previously on Rambo. Thank you. That's an icon of this show. I'll remember that <laughs> shit forever. Um, I talked a bit about not understanding Sylvester Stallone, about thinking he was a meathead uh-huh. and just this action star and had basically nothing to offer to right. cinema. And that certainly isn't the character of Rambo. It's true. But Rocky is not portrayed as a smart guy. No, he's not at all. However, he's a lot more endearing than well, I yeah. imagined. He's not smart, but he's emotional. He's human. Yeah, he's a it's, human being. It's something, that, it's something that you don't usually see from Sly Stallone in a lot of his films because he's either doltish mm-hmm. or a giant gun-toting maniac. Right. And you rarely get an emotional connection. I know The Expendables tried, and we did The Expendables with sure. Machete last year, mm-hmm. but... I don't feel like the strength of the Expendables was Sly Stallone's emotional performance. Exactly. Whereas with Rocky, that's really the strength of the film. Yeah. That was something in the Expendables that was a note about the story, but not as much about the character, which is almost the opposite. Here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the entire story is, you know, these two characters and is his development and what he's getting himself into the stakes, you know, there's a, you feel a lot of that coming from, like I was talking about being in that pet shop and coming up with these, you know, these little lines, or when he's um, ice skating with her, right. right? And all he really has to say is about himself. But strangely, it's not ego. It's just like, you, you feel bad. That's all he knows. Mm-hmm. You know, he knows boxing, and he knows his boxing career. Right. And that's really all he's bringing to the table intellectually. But I think part of what makes that endearing is that he's humble about it, in the way that he is aware that he's stupid right you know he talks yeah. about he talks about these pieces these sure. missing uh components gaps. yes the gaps thank you and how they kind of fill in uh parts of each other's lives and that's where you start to feel the heart of this you feel like he knows he's dumb he cracks jokes about it uh she finds him endearing and that's enough to make him kind of the hero of the mm-hmm. story but then they're also really, you think of Rocky all the time as this classic underdog story. Yeah. And so as I'm watching it this time with you, I'm trying to go through and really pinpoint outside of the movie kind of, the movie's just telling you, here is this romance story. It's not driving in the underdog story as hard as you would think Rocky, the American underdog story, would right. be doing that. Right. It doesn't seem nearly as obvious. Yeah, it's true. As... You know, the movies, it, you can't point to it and go, this is the spot where this happens and this happens. Mm-hmm. And oh, they're clearly trying to make him an underdog here. It's just a lot of the, you know, it's um, it's simple and effective. It's the environments yeah. that they're in. They live in these shitty, dirty little apartments. Rocky talks about how his apartment is temporary. I wonder how many decades he's been saying that yep. for. Um, he has these two little turtles. He basically lives a very simple life. And then he works as a sort of, you know, muscle for a loan shark. We see him in the beginning not breaking this guy's fingers or whatever. So we know what this character is about. And I think a lot of what makes him an underdog is probably defined by Apollo Creed. You know, there are small moments like when he gets his locker taken away, right? Yeah. But even things like fighting for Adrian, he has to fight against Polly who's a friend of his, the biggest sort of quarrel they ever have, the very next scene, they're buddies. He's bringing him a robe, like everything's cool. So all that comes in when you see Carl Weathers' character. Yeah. And you see how collected he is. Yeah. And this is, uh, watching it this time, this character actually seemed to be one of the most interesting ones to me. Mm -hmm. Because he's not a typical villain by any stretch of the imagination. He's smart. He's articulate. He's a businessman. He's a star. He is a star, right. He's the show. And uh, aside from being totally showbiz, he's everything that Rocky isn't. And so that naturally puts Rocky in this kind of underdog position. But I think, you know, it's strange to me watching how effective this is and thinking, 
more films should take this approach. Mm -hmm. You know, we've complained very, very often on this show about the mustache curling uh, sort of villains. Yeah. Just for being too simple and easy. And at the very least, we get a sort of in-depth villain, a villain that has multiple sides to him Mm -hmm. or an ambiguous moral code or something that makes him the villain that isn't just, well, I'm static and evil. Apollo Creed is none of these things, though. He just happens to be the other side of this fight. Right. Now, I guess there's reasons not to like him. You know, he's showbiz, right? I mean, the the moment, if I had to pick out a moment where I don't like Apollo Creed in the whole movie, where I really feel, oh, fuck that guy, he's the villain, it's probably when he's George Washington. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, he's never really doing anything underhanded. He's just doing some WWF magic. It's WWE now, sir. So this is interesting for a few reasons, but Mm -hmm. one is just looking at this character. Sure. You know, um, uh, Carl Weathers plays the guy. Great. But thinking about who Apollo is and how that's written and the fact that it's written by Stallone. So mm-hmm. huge props there to, again, the guy that I totally didn't give any credit to years ago. He comes out and he doesn't hate Rocky. He doesn't even really, he underestimates Rocky, but sure. he doesn't look down on him. Right. He's not constantly thinking, you know, they don't watch Rocky punching slabs of meat on television and think, wow, this guy is such a joke. Right. Instead, uh, you know, one of his guys is, oh, you should check this Rocky guy out. He's for real. And Apollo, ah, I don't have time for that. Right. I have to work on my hat design mm-hmm. for, the, for the show. So it's not that he's an evil guy. The movie's saying, hey, these are all people, and they're mostly good, except drunk Pauly, who right. I still can't figure out to this day, <laughs> who I still have a problem wondering why the movie treats him like this is so okay, the things that he's doing. But aside from that, Apollo isn't even... He's not a villain, and he hasn't really made any ethical or moral mistake that he has to pay for. Right, it's true. Instead, he's just a really honorable opponent. And that makes it even more awesome to see Rocky go you know, 15 rounds or mm-hmm. whatever with the guy. Because then, even with as strange and, and technical a note that the movie ends on, it ends feeling kind of like Rocky is the champion just well, because he was able to stand yeah, up to I that think, guy. Yeah, I think basically instead of, instead of it ending with Rocky winning, it basically just ends with Rocky not having lost. Right. Which is what you want to see happen is you just don't want to see him lose anymore. Yeah, not losing is a victory for him after considering what his life has yeah, been exactly. this entire time. Which is great because it's realistic. It doesn't ask you to take a leap that you probably would anyways. Sure in saying, oh, yeah, well, he won because he trained really hard in that montage. Just have to point out that this is the montage this of all montage. montages here. When South Park, when Team America, when Matt and Trey mock montages, that is the Rocky montage they're pointing their finger directly at. So anyways, that builds a Rocky up as a character, just seeing that he defeated an opponent who wasn't an underhanded, shitty opponent. He mm-hmm. was actually somebody who's really good at what he does and a, a fairly good guy. Sure. Oddly, this movie fits in not only in this strange journey you and I are taking here, but it's notable for something technical outside of just being the franchise it is. And that's the Steadicam. Uh-huh. So Steadicam gets thrown around a lot, but are you, are you pretty familiar with this as a rig? Do you kind of know how this thing operates or uh, what it looks like? I know kind of what it looks like, but you'd probably be better at describing it than I would. It's, a, it's like a harness, right? Yeah. It's, um, so before this, when you're dealing with film, you were mainly dealing with cameras mounted on things. Or I guess the sloppy alternative of uh, carrying your camera around with you. If you had a small enough camera, maybe you're doing video or something like we actually see the reporters doing uh, in this movie, you could mount it on a shoulder. That's done for kind of on-the-scene new stuff all Mm -hmm. the time. But for actually filming uh, motion picture, you're usually using these fairly heavy dollies and... Things that move carts on wheels, right? Let's Mm -hmm. boil this down here. Carts on wheels and cameras on the end of, of, you know, sticks. And this movie came out in, I want to say, 76. And it was really the beginning of the proliferation of Steadicam. There were a couple films to use it before. There was a documentary that used it uh, pretty notably. But this movie was sort of the popularization of that in narrative fiction. And this camera setup essentially allowed you it's a pretty heavy setup and it takes kind of a i probably couldn't operate one myself uh, i've been on the set of something while they're filming with a steady cam and it looks heavy and fucking intense 
there's one guy, the operator, the essentially the cameraman who will wear this thing, and then a bunch of other people who kind of swarm around him doing fuck knows what, uh, probably waiting for him to fall and try and pick yeah. up this expensive equipment. But the system, this this harness is built in such a way where the movement of the camera is flexible but fluid. So you don't get the shaky camera that you would if you were hand holding it. You know, if you sure. were dealing with the sure. handy cam Cloverfield esque right. sort of look. A one that's oddly come back around, you know, uh twenty or thirty years after we worked so hard to find <laughs> steady cam. Uh, but it's used, you could see its use and ultimately its effect in stabilization in the boxing match at the very end. And the way they follow this entire match is through the use, if not solely, extensive use of this study cam. Yeah. It lets them follow these actors anywhere they want to go. So this is a great boon to action. You use it for action all the time. We saw it, uh, I remember we were watching Desperado, that kind of opening pit fight or the one that happens mm -hmm. early on. I remember Rodriguez talking about that being his first study cam shot and, uh, and how he took a course or some kind of class or uh, went to some group or something that basically taught him to operate this because yeah. one man film crew doesn't want to let anybody operate his study cam. Sure. I think it's pretty rare that directors will actually do that. Because of the, the intense physicality of it, a lot of times you have no other option. And now it almost seems like a go-to. It seems uh, in your head easier than rigging up a complicated system of how do I move this cart through these corridors and right. these different scenes. Sure, tracking Instead, and what have you. Right. Instead, I'm going to mount this really heavy fucking camera on me and, uh, and still get some pretty fluid shots out of it. And when you compare something um, like you know this last scene in Rocky to some of the handheld camera stuff... Even the modern stuff where we have, you know, post stabilization technology, stuff like motion where you can, yeah. you know, even that out, uh, the Steadicam is still kind of the go to. Mm -hmm. So, in perfect double feature fashion, ending on a strange technical note, I believe you have a mystifying Asian journey. I do. To uh, embark upon me. Yeah. So, did I use any of those words correctly just now, by the way? Yeah, they were all em embark spot on. upon me. Is that how? Oh, no. I would embark upon. You would give journey to me. Sure. I'm going to sit in the cart and you drive the donkey on this one. Is that better? That's I'll just, I'll just push edge. the cart for you. It's starting to get awkward. Okay, so as if this wasn't already complicated enough, Shogun Assassin isn't the original of itself. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> so Am basically, I going to need to know math for this double feature? Uh, you're going to need to be able to count to 345. All right. So in the early 1970s, there was a film version of a very famous manga. Manga is... Uh, Code for backwards comic book. Okay, um, great. Thank you for that. And I love the way you boil things down. It's perfect. And uh, it was called Lone Wolf and Cub, and it tells the story of this ex samurai who ends up taking his son on a journey to kill a bunch of people. So in the seventies, they made the first of what ended up being six films mm. called the Lone Wolf and Cub movies. I know what you're thinking. Six Lone Wolf and Cub movies, six Rocky movies, this seems perfect, and it does, but that's not what we're doing. Too easy. Far too easy. Instead, we're taking this 1980 film, Shogun Assassin, which is a Roger Corman-headed chop and piece together fest of the first two Lone Wolf and Cub movies. Basically, this film was, quote, designed for American audiences. The score is redone to be more hip to Americans. They dub it. There's narration, there's a lot of blood, and very little downtime. So just to give people an idea, when I hear something like designed for Americans, I am equal parts offended and excited by what yeah. the results will be. Well, the thing is, is I've seen all of the Lone Wolf and Cub movies, and we could have done them. It would have been a lot of downtime and not as much blood as I want to cover, especially for this particular experience. If we're going to get Kill Bill in here... We don't have time to go through Lone Wolf and Cub 1 through sure, 6. I hear you. So Shogun Assassin is basically, the plot is almost unimportant. A father <laughs> and his son <laughs> sure. who go and essentially they want to get revenge for his wife who was murdered by yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the road with ninjas. I exactly. What's really important about the film is the blood. Mm -hmm. The rivers of spraying blood. Sure, sure. And the fact that there's a utility cart that cuts up ninjas. Sure. Right. The whole thing is 
told through the eyes of this little boy. Use the right word. Got to use the right word here. It's told through the eyes of this little baby. Baby. Name, better. Much named better. Diagoro. I'm going to go with Cub. Call Easier Cub. for me. And it's all narrated in, in little baby voice. And he tells the story and he very, very subtly gives the exposition for the story. And eventually they all get on a boat. The only thing subtle about that was your fucking sarcasm. <laughs> this is the most over the top narration. I mean, it's we have to go with uh, baby, not kid. Yeah, baby's fine. He's in a he's in the, a cart. He's in a what are those called? Carriage carts, um, strollers. Right. Call it a stroller. It's an assassin stroller. Yeah. Samurai stroller is that better? Samurai stroller is good too. I like that a lot better. I wish that could be a film term, but there's no reason. I mean, we would just never use that again. Just to make sure we say samurai stroller on a, an upcoming show. The only thing that throws me off about this not just being a baby is that it talks. Right. But for all intents and purposes, beyond the dialogue, which is clearly <laughs> not it. So in the original, uh, the original Lone Wolf and Cub stuff, uh -huh. is it still the same idea with the narration? There's no narration. Oh, really? Yeah, there's no narration at all. So Corman added a talking baby. Yeah, to he the added thing. a talking baby. Wow. I'm sure Asian cinema fans are yeah. committing seppuku well, at this you point. But of course, the original footage had the baby. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely. we're not, we haven't deviated that far. Right. It's, uh, I mean, looking at this, and I noticed this uh, specifically in the scene where he's bringing water to his dad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like watching a trained animal watching babies <laughs> act. I mean, you know what I mean? Sure. It's like we've convinced a little animal to get some water. And then, you know, I'm, I'm thinking well, anytime I see animals acting in film, I wonder what they're dangling behind the camera to get them to look around and do these different things. Uh -huh. I'm asking the same of this baby. Right. I don't think this is ever more obvious than the scene where the baby is acting across from a monkey. Yeah. And I really, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering the same thing with both of them. My mind is in the exact same place. <laughs> they seem perfect. I mean, I could watch an entire film of this baby and this monkey. Yeah. That's not true. Please don't send me that film. So the thing I think that separates Shogun Assassin from a lot of other Asian ninja cinema are the fact that one, all the ninjas are secret. And two... <laughs> secret ninjas. Hold on. Can we dwell on that for just a moment? Absolutely. Secret lady ninjas as well. <laughs> Where do the swords come from? You know, it's fascinating to watch this movie. And I'm wondering, without your help, how long it would have taken me to... I'm a very gullible person when it comes to humanity. Uh -huh. I tend to believe in people and be highly skeptical of ideas and facts. Sure. Uh, when I see a bunch of people wandering around, I assume they're normal people, not ninjas. And uh, fool me once, right? Fool me twice. Sure. Fool me about seven or eight times. I never really pick up on the fact <laughs> that everyone is a ninja yeah. and they're all going to pull out this. You would think by the second, maybe third time, uh -huh. I would get, all right, secret ninjas are all over yeah. the place. I'm wondering how many of these fucking movies we're going to do before I'm <laughs> actually suspicious of people being secret ninjas. Oh, it's just going to get worse from here. I promise you. Fingers crossed. So the other thing that sets it apart is the fact that there is a baby. I also believe that uh, Lone Wolf and Cub 3 is called Baby Death Carriage, but don't quote me on that. I'm not joking. The God. other thing that sets it apart is the baby. It's the fact that a lot of other films would have a samurai go out, cut up a bunch of people, but instead you have this really cool scene in the beginning where the Lone Wolf takes his son and essentially goes, if you pick the ball, I'm going to kill you. Right, if you right. pick the sword, you can kill people with me. But see, because they're Asian, it's honorable. Right, exactly. Could you just imagine the horror of that in an American <laughs> film? Yeah. How completely fucked up that is? It wouldn't be the same. You can't get away with no, it. No, not at all. No, but if it happens here sure. in this film, everybody sure. totally like, oh yeah, honor. Oh, I yeah, Right, honor. Honor and, and propriety. But instead, he not only does he bring the baby along, but the baby helps him kill these <laughs> sure, secret ninjas. Sure, yeah. They're a dynamic uh, team at this point. Yeah, the baby the baby at least activates the, the carriage twice. Right, right. And there's also this really dramatic scene at the end of the film where they stumble upon the baby in some desert bramble. Sure. And he points to his father yeah. way An off amazing in the distance. Setup. Yeah. What I really like about the film is that it's so exploitative. And so when you think... Asian 70s samurai film, right. this delivers everything 
that your mind really does. wishes you could see. Right. It's severed limbs. It's spraying blood. It's a baby rejecting a tit. Right. All of these things and more will Supreme take Supreme Ninja jumping out of her clothes and yeah. running away backwards. Yeah. What the fuck <laughs> is happening in that scene, by the way? So many wonderful things. So at the end of this film, they end up in this desert. Mm. The problem with Shogun Assassin just being Lone Wolf and Cub parts one and two is that he never assassinates the Shogun. Yeah, right. A little weird. He ends up getting asked by a village to kill the Shogun's brother, who has also transgressed some terrible, dishonorable things. And he ends up in the desert fighting the three guys that we uh, saw a couple years back in Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> sure, the three brothers. And he never kills the Shogun. Despite the fact that the Shogun is clearly, even in this cut of the film, appears to be the villain. He's yeah. the boss. Yeah, absolutely. He's the boss. That's a great way to put it. This is this is so perfect to call the Shogun the boss, and then you kill the mini boss, right? And it ends the film. It's like talking about. Uh, I think Taken. We talked about a lot of a lot of the kill the boss stuff. But in this end part of the the movie here, when he kills mm -hmm. the three brothers or the three super ninjas or whatever you want to call them, I like the fact that he does some of the most heinously terrible thing he cuts one guy's head in half sure, okay sure perfect example and he is so serious he doesn't know that there is anything funny about the fact that this ninja's head is split in half and it's squirting blood in the air right everything that goes on for the lone wolf is dead fucking serious yeah and i'm not sure you know it's hard to tell having not seen these originals sure. and judging just it's by. really a good representation it just takes out a lot of the talking in the subtitles well so the talking and the subtitles uh, may lend some information as to whether or not the movies have a sense of humor yeah or if they're unaware of the blood and the spraying it's probably closer to the second one. You think so? Yeah. Now, do you think Corman has a sense of humor about it? Is oh, it yeah. funny to him then? I'm sure Corman saw the original films and went, all we need is all the parts where people's blood sprays and a tit. Right. But at the end of this film, there is somebody that understands the irony of the, of the situation. Mm -hmm. He's the, uh, the third super ninja. To have it happen to my own neck is ridiculous. <laughs> I can't believe... What I just heard. Yeah. You know, most of the time in a movie like this, a very stylistically visual movie, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's because we're thinking so much about, uh, about Kill Bill, knowing sure. that that's, well, it's, it, that's, out, I mean, but... it's, it, I'm glad that you brought up Kill Bill earlier mm -hmm. on in the show because it's really important to think about Kill Bill if you, if it's not all, if it's not obvious. Right. There's a lot of this in Kill Bill. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I can definitely see that. So I'm paying attention to that style. I'm paying sure. attention to visually what they're doing and uh, all of the close-ups of Lone Wolf's face that yep. could have been shot in about uh, probably about 15 minutes on yep. one day of shooting by changing angles and backgrounds. I'm paying very little attention to the dialogue. So I'm sure they're saying insane shit throughout the entire film. <laughs> but I'm really just, which direction is the blood pumping? How are they composing their frame? I'm, I'm nerding out on sure. the movie. And uh, to have it happen to my own neck is ridiculous. I don't, it sounds like something I would say on this fucking show. Right, right. It doesn't sound like something you actually put <laughs> right. in your film. It's possibly the worst, it, as if the dubbing weren't already not good. Right. In well, this let's film. Not, and the Foley too. True. I, the Foley adds a very distinct kind of feel to this film mm -hmm. in that there isn't a lot of Foley. Right. <laughs> Some right. films have so much Foley that that's what's comedic. This film is missing a lot of sound. Right. You would expect these swords to buckle sure. and make more cool sounds. Well, there's the one scene early on, which is actually from the first Lone Wolf movie, where he is in the room and he, he slices the piece of paper. That's mm -hmm. the memorable section there. And then he starts fighting a bunch of guys in this, in this room. Right. And he stands up and slices some guys and then runs to a doorway and to the left with no sound. It is right. dead silent. Right. No footsteps. No people talking, right. grumbling. It's dead silent. That is exactly the same as it is in the Japanese version. Interesting. And you know, and as you were talking about this too, and having only seen this once, yeah. and having seen it just now, 
and I mean, having it be Shogun Assassin. The, um, <laughs> the you know, I'm I talk about the Foley, and I don't want it to sound like it's a bad thing. No, I actually feel like it's really part of the the genetic makeup. It's part of the of experience. What this movie? Not to come on here and say you know to try and sound like I know anything about Shogun Assassin, mm-hmm. but we have completely silent uh, ninjas. I yeah. mean. As a byproduct of the absence of Foley, we also have a lot of other things that are completely silent. But when you start to see the way these guys move around, yeah, and hear that there aren't footsteps or that there, you know, there aren't sounds, I mean, that brings a lot of interesting ideas to mind of how you can play with sound sure. or even just the absence of sound, right? To give somebody more of a superhuman. I mean, at the end of the day, these are people in costumes running at each other. Yeah. There's nothing they really do special effects wise, aside from kind of putting things in silhouettes and, uh-huh. you know, some camera work to make this appear superhuman. But if you see these people, and, and perhaps we'll come across this, you know, more as we see some of these, when certain things happen in movies, you expect certain types of responses. And even though when I run across a room barefoot, I'm not going to make much of a sound. Mm -hmm. You see it in a movie, you expect a sound. Right. When you don't get a sound, there's something almost magic about what they're doing. Sure. And I don't know if you can deny that that's part of, you know, like I said, the the genetic makeup of what this is. Well, it's part of what, it's part of what kind of turns it into an interesting genre piece. It it chalks it up there in its own world alongside spaghetti westerns. Mm -hmm where it's just the kind of film where people are doing these fantastic things, killing rivers of blood, right? killing rivers of blood worth of these secret ninjas. And the whole time you're just hoping for revenge, right? Because this is an inhuman master of swordplay Mm -hmm. and nothing can stop him. If you see him die, it's just horribly disappointing. You couldn't you couldn't ever down. lose that character because he's he's a hero. He's the idol. Yeah. He's something that you could never achieve in real life. It's the disconnect that you get. It's you know, it's what little kids want to be a ninja for. Excellent. Well put. People say his brain was infected by devils. Is that the line from I, the, I think yeah, that is the thing. It's uh it's in a cage song. It's cage is the most popular of these weird hip hop things that I found. Uh-huh. Um, the others being uh, Sage Francis and Macromantics and Cubby Bear. A lot of these uh, just cool, strange um, hip hop things. I haven't even really, I don't know enough about music to know why they're collected as a genre outside uh-huh. of all kind of being on the same record label or whatever. Last year, we accidentally did uh, five or six films that are all kind of name dropped in songs by this. I think she's Australian. It's an Australian rapper uh, who goes by Macromantics. Uh-huh. And it was weird finding that album and just going, oh, a film reference. Oh, we did that film. Oh, another <laughs> film. Oh, wow. Well, we're doing that film next week. It was uh, very bizarre. But this is from the song Agent Orange that that uh, little huh. sample is used from. It's so weird. It never... I mean, being a fan of Rob Zombie yeah. and then hearing some of these references once in a while and not nearly as often as you would sure. imagine, that's strange enough. But then hearing something, knowing you know it for some reason, right? it just kind of sticks in the back of my mind and goes, well, where the fuck is that from? The only other thing I wanted to mention about this movie, and like I said, I have no idea what happened dialogue-wise, <laughs> but uh, the movie ends on a wish is only a wish. A wish is only a wish. And just as with Rocky, I think it's a mistake to read into either of these too much. Uh-huh. Most of what's on display is very clearly yeah, on display. Yeah, absolutely. And- I'm not going to underestimate everyone listening to this that they couldn't pick up on it themselves. I just love the idea of, man, it would be really great if things were different. Well, wishing that is actually not going to do anything. So yep. here's to that. It's as if the kid is saying, well, when your dad's a Shogun assassin, he tries to assassinate the Shogun. <laughs> well said. We have a website, which mm-hmm. is doublefeatureshow.com. You can find Amazon and, of course, iTunes links to uh-huh. every movie we've pretty much ever talked about. Should you uh, want to download those and watch them before listening to the show? Sure. Or just to fucking see them again. Send us an email as well. It's doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Right. Uh, always interested to hear, you know, if you're going along on this uh, magical adventure with sure. us here and uh, plan on watching all six of both of these films or either franchise, 
just want to hear some feedback, hear your thoughts, uh, curious what you thought. Having done some simple and effective movies this mm -hmm. week, I kind of wanted to go into some different territory on okay. the next episode. Yeah. So what do we got film-wise? We're going to do American Psycho and Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. So we're certainly not leaving any of the blood behind. That's, that's true. That's going to be a constant, uh, basically forever, I think. Yeah, I think we're just going to, I think this is going to be, this is going to be a blood heavy year. Totally fine with that. I don't yeah. think anybody's complaining about that. The one thing that I think we should mention about it is that if you haven't seen the films or if you're going to watch them again, try not to watch them as horror movies. Yeah, definitely. They both get lumped into that category yeah. quite a bit. But I think, you know, in discussing what's on display there, we're not really going to be talking about a lot of the usual horror stuff that we do on right. the show. Anyways, that leaves us with... Uh, oh, watch more fucking film? Bye.